My name is Empty Without Brain. Surprise, surprise, Sean has blocked me, literally a day after I responded to his personal message. In your video, Traditional Morality versus Modern Morality, you have suggested how the morality before the Enlightenment age represented the objective standard. Now, this is quite controversial, Sean, considering how the Enlightenment age has re represented intellectual scientific development and cultural life, where reason was advocated as the primary source for legitimacy and authority. It is also known as the Age of Reason. But for the moment, let's apply the steps to understand your position concerning the points you make in your videos on objective morality. So let's define what objective means, free of any bias or prejudice caused by personal feelings, based on facts rather than thoughts or opinions, observable, something that can be measured or observed directly, for example, temperature. Now let's define what morality means, involving right and wrong, derived from personal conscience, encouraging goodness and decency, and based on personal conviction. Sean, you speak of applying critical thinking when drawing conclusions. However, you have not applied any of the steps involved in the process of critical thinking. Critical thinking is a complex process of deliberation which involves a wide range of skills and attitudes. Now let's use the steps of the critical thinking process. Identify the other person's position, argument and conclusion. Since you have claimed that objective morality is portrayed in the Bible, this is your position. Step 2. Evaluate the evidence from an alternative point of view. You have pointed out how God is an external source and demands his standard to be obeyed as it says in the Bible, so the Bible is acting as your source of evidence. Step 3. Weigh up the opposition's evidence to support their arguments fairly. In a nutshell, Sean, until you are able to prove to anyone that your specific God physically exists, there is no reason why anyone should even consider the Bible as an objective source, as a guide to morality. Step 4. Determine any unfair assumptions and false pieces of evidence. Your assumptions are determined by your interpretations of the Bible. You have failed to address how the Bible is objective. For example, how is it free of any bias or prejudice caused by personal feelings? Is it based on facts rather than thoughts and opinions? Step 5. Recognize techniques to portray information by applying more appealing positions than others, for instance, false logic and persuasive devices. You often apply the strategy below to your arguments concerning morality. But it's nothing new, you are just rehashing the same old vocal garbage used by goodness knows how many people and has been refuted time and time again. Step 6 reflecting on issues in a structured way, using logic and insight. You often refer to anyone who doesn't agree with your point of view of objective morality as a Satanist, so I don't think you have been able to determine your con conclusions past your own interpretation of the Bible. That isn't very reflective or logical. You have not applied any thought or consideration to anyone else's point of view. Step 7. Determine the argument's validity, reliability, and whether the evidence is justifiable to create a sensible assumption. Again, Sean, until you can prove the physical existence of your specific God, there is no reason for people to consider that the Bible speaks the word of God and should be obeyed. And finally, Step 8. Present a point of view in a well-structured, clear, and reasoned way that will convince others. I'm going to be quite blunt, Sean, but you have not convinced anyone with any common sense. Now I would like to invite Richard Dawkins to finish off with a final point. Do you think there could be one sentence that could convince um, 
let's say, a creationist to seriously doubt their theory. Ideally, if you could convince a believer in God to really doubt their belief, but that's too hard. Not sure about a, about a sentence. I think perhaps the single most convincing fact, the observation that you could point to would be the, um, the pattern of resemblances that you see when you compare the genes using modern DNA techniques, actually looking at the letter-to-letter the -letter correspondences between genes. Compare the genes of any pair of animals you like, uh, pair of animals, pair of plants, and then plot out the resemblances and they fall on a perfect hierarchy, a perfect family tree. And the only alternative to it being a family tree is that the intelligent designer deliberately set out to deceive us in the most underhand and devious manner. Um, <laughs> More, moreover, the same thing works with, with every gene you do separately, and even pseudogenes that don't do anything but are vestigial relics of genes that once, that once did something. I find it extremely hard to imagine how any creationist who actually bothered to listen to that could possibly doubt the fact of evolution. But they don't listen. I mean, there's, there's, your, your question is a, is a perfectly good question, but it's not, it's not really relevant because what they do is simply stick their fingers in their ear and say, la, la, la. They know what's true because it's in the holy book. And that, that even, I mean, the most extreme case is the geologist Kurt Wise, who has a PhD in geology from Harvard, and said, if all the evidence in the universe pointed towards an old earth, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a young earth creationist because that is what Holy Scripture teaches me. You cannot argue with, 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 a, with, a, with a mind like that. A mind like that, it seems to me, is, well, a disgrace to the human species. Thanks for watching, please subscribe, please comment and please rate.